This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, Australia's oldest family-owned salt company. This for me is now the, this is what we've been training for. This is what we've been traveling for. This is what we've been giving up our time for. This is what the compromises have been for. And Woodcut for me is, it's just the dream restaurant. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. In part one, Ross Lusted took us on a journey through his career from South Africa to Australia and all over the globe. Today, he tells us about the challenges of running a fine dining restaurant with the Bridge Room and how its success led to what may be the defining moment in his career, Woodcut Restaurant. Ross, You've told us about your career all around the globe, but how did the Bridge Room come about? So I'd always loved that building in Bridge Street, 44 Bridge Street. It was an Art Deco building. It reminded me of a Edward Hopper painting that I'd always loved called Nighthawks. Um, it's sort of got these windows that wrap around and at night it just glowed. And um, we came back to Sydney and... Um, poured a shitload of money into a little restaurant on the corner of Bridge Street and Young Street um, with Leon Fink. And, um, you know, Leon, Leon was, for me, a bit like Adrian, incredibly committed to – and Leon's not a, a restaurateur. Um, <clears throat> well, he is, but he's also had four other professions. He's a property developer. He's a racehorse owner. He comes from a, a family who sold textiles. Um, and he's Jewish and I don't know, but I seem to have a lot of Jewish people in my life and, um, I find them very grounded and, um, very giving and very, um, uh, loyal and, um, Leon and I and Sonny just had this fantastic relationship. He's hard, but so generous and so fair and so like-minded and, and, um, you know, and we were, had people like Peter Gilmore and um, Lennox Hastie was there at the time. And there was just this, I don't know, it felt really right. And uh, so we opened this little restaurant called The Bridge Room. I was obsessed with cooking on charcoal. And everywhere, it, it reminded me of my, my childhood in South Africa, my time in Indonesia, cooking over charcoal in Japan, Croatia, Montenegro, the US. So the underlying thing for me was these, I don't have a, f a cuisine. Uh, people say, what kind of food do you cook? And, and it might sound cliche, but it's, it's just, it's memories. It's food of my travel. It's stuff that I've eaten somewhere that I go, that, that, was, that was a clever idea. And then you mold it into something else. And um, I think that's what... The bridge room was. I needed to. I needed to uh, draw a line under that. Um, that that angst in my in my um, that was just in the back of my head saying, "Are you really good enough to do that? To own your own restaurant? To be the you know? I'd worked for Neil Perry, for David Thompson. I'd done other things, but it was never your name on the front of the door." And um, so it was something I needed to do. It was it was um, burning a hole, and and uh, so we did it. And we kicked a few goals at the Bridge Room. Well, you kicked a couple of goals. You won Chef of the Year, three hats. Um, the string of accolades is longer than I can uh, even consider. What's your memories of Bridge Room, and and, and uh, how important was it in the changes that you've had? to move on to woodcut? You know, there, there was a time. There was a time when um, um, there, was, there was food and everything I understood about food and cooking. And then I stopped cooking for 12 years. And in that time, um, Il Bulli for Anadria had happened. Spain was going on a trajectory. Uh, Heston Blumenthal had happened. Um, there was a lot that was happening in Sydney 
there was Martin Ben, obviously uh, Peter Gilmore. Uh, there was the was obviously the the generation, let's say before that, Neil, uh, Yanni. Um, I know I'm forgetting a lot, but um, Greg Doyle has always been a mentor. Tetsuya, um, I remember always being able to talk to Greg. Um, never worked with Greg. He was just always someone I could pick up the phone to. There's friends like Simon Johnson, um, who always Sussman, and you know everyone supports you. And but it's almost irrelevant. You know, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter how much support you have. You have to do it yourself. And when we opened the doors, I absolutely shit myself because it was everything. It was all the money that we had made living overseas and working overseas and sacrificing. Because you're away from your family, you're doing amazing things, but don't get me wrong, you are away from your family. And you also get, sometimes you get a bit frustrated, so you say, fuck it, let's just go to New York, and you blow a whole lot of money because you just have been living in the desert um, for six months. You know, so you, you sort of now, we had this responsibility um, first time I'd ever owned my own business. Um, and I thought we'd just open a little restaurant, I'd hire a chef, and I'd go off and do these other things that I wanted to do. And um, like work on hotel development and paint and all that sort of stuff. And the bridge room sort of became all consuming, but it was the time that I've never been more creative in my life. Um, wow. And, but there was this, all this molecular shit that I didn't understand any of it. <laughs> and so I was just cooking like I knew how to cook, but I wasn't – I'd never heard of xanthan gum and all this other, you know, agar agar and all these. So I suddenly had to sp- spend all my time off researching and reading and, and – but then thinking, well, that's getting off track. That's not – this is about cooking on charcoal and smoke and ash and all those things. I worked with Alex Olsen because I wanted to create this smoked salt that I'd seen in Dubrovnik. Um, and it wasn't actually smoked salt. It was, they just kept a bag of salt and where they cooked all the pecker and, you know, the lamb and the veal and, and all that under the bell. And when I said to the guy, Oh, you smoke your own salt. He said, no, just sit in the corner, get smoky. <laughs> you know, <isn't> it? <laughs> You know, we worked with Charlie Costello when he was at uh, Pialago State and we created the smoked salt with Alison, uh, Alex Olsen, the red gum smoked salt. So I sort of had this vehicle that I could do anything um, and I sort of got to the point one day at Bridge Room where I was just, fuck it, I'm just going to do what I, I can do and that's what I did and that's when we sort of got our third hat and I won Chef of the Year and it was just a time. It's just a time where... I know things align, you f- you have confidence. I mean, I used to question every day what we were doing. I had an amazing team of people, the amount of t- people that went through there. Some hated it, some loved it. It was a hard kitchen. We had no cool rooms. It was, you know, three square, three metres by 11 metres, including dishwashing and plate storage and everything. It was hard. No, you know, it was a front door. Everything came in and out. But I made my ceramics for there and we created something I think that was different for Sydney. Um, people, some complained that we didn't have tablecloths, a fine dining restaurant. And it was like, fuck, now we're a fine dining restaurant. I don't want to be a fine dining restaurant. I just want to be a neighbourhood restaurant that had an a la carte menu. And then you win two hats and you have to do degustation. It's like, I don't want to do degustation. I just want to cook, you know. So I think, um, you know, it was a time where, we just did what we did and, you know, Sonny's not a restaurateur, so Sonny used to run the business. We had great restaurant managers over the years. and But for me, it was it was always the stepping stone. Uh, it was hard work. It's physically hard. I'm 50 now and it was hard. It was hard on my body, hard on my knees, hard on my mental health. Um, small restaurants are just hard. Um, and you don't make any money. <laughs> you absolutely don't make any money. I can tell you that for a fact. With the successes that you had and the fact that you felt as creative as you've ever been, was it hard to let go of the bridge room? No, it was very easy. I, I, I had to come back to Sydney and either just disappear into hotel land or I had to make a statement and be a player 
if you're not a player in this city, in our business, um, for me personally, it's not worth it. I'm not going to work that hard and not be a player. So how do you be a player? How do you become a player? You have to do something significant. And, and the critiques, not, not, not the food critiques, the customers. Everyone is a food critic today. Everyone has an iPhone, an opinion, and a, and, and a, and a platform. So TripAdvisor is our food critic. Um, the, the newspapers are, the publications, the podcasts, the Instagram is our critic today. So we've never had it harder in our business. We are public. We are, we are out there. And every plate of food that you put down, you, you can potentially um, be open up to any sort of criticism. I mean, I used to get criticized for not being in the restaurant, but I was doing MasterChef. So it's like, well, he's doing MasterChef. Oh, yeah, but I came here and I'm paying my money. He should be here. And that's what you get in a restaurant that has an open kitchen. Um, but Woodcut as a concept had been – we'd already developed the idea. We'd printed a 40-page book of it and I was, wow. I was trying to do it. I thought Australia – there's no vehicle for it here in Australia. Who's going to have a 1,000 square metres? It's going to cost – a fortune. I don't have the resources. Um, we'd spoken to Leon about doing it. Um, we'd looked at a couple of sites. Um, I'd spoken to people in LA, Hong Kong, Singapore, uh, a friend in New York. We flirted with the idea of Tokyo. Um, but we'd had this book and um, at the time, John Alexander, who was the chairman of Crown at the time, used to dine at the Bridge Room a lot and um, we sat, sat down one day and I never realized that John was probably interviewing me over the course of six months but he would ask me sort of individual questions and you know about revenue and about groups in Sydney or Australia and what do you think and what's your opinion and what do you think about IPO of restaurant companies and all that sort of stuff and I, I that was my world that was my world in Amman. And uh, so I understood that side of the business and, and um, they um, called one day and said, do you want to have a chat? And um, they said, we're doing something in Sydney and uh, do you have an idea about doing something big? And I said, well, hold on a sec. And I gave them the book and I think they got to about the third page of the book and Crown at that time for me was a very, very big company. It suddenly became an extremely small company. Um, we dealt direct, directly with John, um, and who was obviously James's voice in, in Australia, and Peter Krenis, um, Peter Krenis, um, CEO of Crown Hotels and Resorts, and and um, I'd sort of known Peter from Hyatt days, and um, it was in in some ways it was very quick. Um, and I was – we're probably very bullish. I went in and I said, we want to be on the ground floor. We want to be on the water. I want to choose my own architect. I have a very specific idea. It's going to be four kitchens, yada, yada. And, <laughs> and Sonny walking out of the meeting going, um, you need to think about how you express <laughs> your requests, your requirements. But, you know, we're a – you know, Sonny and I are a team. We've done, we've done big projects and I think – this is this for me is now the this is what we've been training for this is what we've been traveling for this is what we've been giving up our time for this is what the compromises have been for and woodcut for me is it's just the dream restaurant and i'm not just saying that in a i've thought about this for a long 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 time you know it's very considered um for me, I'd given up on the idea of entree main course dessert as a concept for a restaurant. I think it's um, – look, there's a lot of chefs who listen to this podcast. I'm not going to say it's done, but for me, it was done. Uh, for me, it was done as a – because it it traps me. You, you, I was building a trap for myself saying, how many entrees? Do we have eight? Do we have 10? Do we have 12? Fuck, how many seafood is it going to be? How many meat? What about the vegetarians? So I'm like, this just – it's all pissing me off. And um, for the people who know me, I get pissed off pretty quickly. And um, to resolve that, um, I had to change my view of what I, what I wanted my restaurant to be. And so for me, it was the cooking methods that really have always sort of been there in the back of my mind. 
um, wood ovens, ash grills, steam kettles, the wood ovens, um, Sunny's predominantly vegetarian, so there's a big vegetable counter. And now I take an ingredient and I say, you know, to my head chefs, what are we doing with this? Where's this, where's this going to sit best? In steam kettles, what do you think? What about the wood oven? Let's grill it. So let's try it. Let's take it and put it into four different methods and let's see what comes out of that. And that for me, this is some of the most exciting cooking I've done. I have, I have the refinement of what the bridge room taught me. I have the, what I, what I, you know, burning celeriac and, you know, the chefs are about to throw it in the bin because I'm like, fuck, you burnt all the celeriac. I said, grill it and put it in the staff salad. They burnt the shit out of it. Instead of throwing it out, we, I said, no, no, give it here. I said, I like the smell of it. So we cooked it with some verju and blended it with loads of butter and there we had it, burnt celeriac puree. Um, so those are the things that for me, that was the bridge room. I was, I was teaching myself. I was training myself. I was learning how to cook again. And um, I was lucky in a sense that the public went along with that journey and actually some of the shit that we served at the bridge room, I shouldn't say that, some of the food that we served at the bridge room, <laughs> I look back now and go, Jesus Christ, what was I thinking? But it's, it's a, it's a you, you have to do that. You have to go on that journey. Well, me personally, I, I had to do that. I had to learn how to cook again. And I think for young chefs who are listening to this, um, go to the fish markets, if you don't have it in your in your restaurant now, you have to teach yourself. You are responsible for teaching yourself. It's not on the people you work for, the restaurants you work in, or you are responsible to do that. And I really believe that. And I've I give my chefs homework. You know, what one of the chefs said the other day, we were talking about something. He said, "What is that?" And I said, "Write it down and go and find out what it is." I know what it is. My chefs know what it is, but you don't. So that's your homework. When you know it, come back tomorrow and tell me what it is. And those are the things that I sort of task my chefs with every day is like you have to educate. So I've, in, in Woodcut, um, we have very little storage, but I, I have a bookshelf that is, you know, five, five shelves. And I put all my books there and any chef can take a book and borrow it like a library. Because I said, no, you are responsible. No one's, I can teach you what you learn in the restaurant, but this is a busy restaurant. We, we are there to help. We are there to educate, but I'm not your sole tutor of what you need to get out of your career. If you need to understand food costs, business side of it, that, that, will, that will come and we can teach you that. And, and we have succession planning for our, for our management team. And to employ 150 people in this current environment, um, everyone has their spot and everyone is there for a reason, but we are a, a business that is growing as well. And out of COVID and out of all the challenges that we've all had, um, we, we are a success story, um, which is fantastic for me. And, um, you know, a lot of people think I have a crystal ball that, you know, I moved overseas at the right time after the Olympics um, because I saw the writing on the wall. No, I didn't. I got offered a job in Singapore. Um, people said, oh, you closed the bridge room right before COVID. What a genius. I said, no, A&P was being demolished. That was my COVID. I lost a shitload of money because of that. Um, so no one, I think, in this industry has a crystal ball. I certainly don't. All I know that for Woodcut, it's the restaurant that, is all about my 30 years I've been in this business. This episode of Deep in the Weeds is proudly supported by Olsen Salt, makers of Australian sea salt since 1948. We take the seawater from Great Australian Bight and then we store it in something called a primary pond. Then it's fed through a succession of ponds from anywhere between eight months and two years until it gets so heavy in brine and the water is evaporated off, the salt starts to fall out of the water and it's as simple as that. That's all that we do and we wash it in seawater and package it. Hi, I'm Alex Olson from Olson Sea Salt. 
Salts all over the world can taste differently and that's because salt has character in the same way that a wine has character from where it's grown. So salt from the Eyre Peninsula has a very fresh, clean, crisp flavour that some of the best chefs in Australia appreciate. Eyre Peninsula is a, a really remote location and because it's remote, it's considered a very pristine area. I mean, the next landfall is the Antarctic and that pristine water makes it a perfect place to make sea salt. For more information, go to olsons.com.au. Well, there's a lot of personal touches in the restaurant. What, 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 are, what are some of your favourites? Oh, you know, look, um, Rod Fisher is my architect um, and I'm probably Rod's worst client um, because I am a frustrated architect, designer. Um, I, I, I don't... I don't believe in boundaries, as I think you've probably understood in the last hour that we've been talking. Um, I don't feel that my area is – there's a line where I should not cross. I cross every line because I think you get a better result. Um, so I'm very vocal. I've, I limit the architects on the materials because I think it makes them work harder. And um, so in this project, it was steel, oak, uh, stone, everything that's tactile, everything natural materials – uh, there is definitely the DNA of the bridge room. It wouldn't, it wouldn't be that. It, I couldn't let Rod just go off and design a restaurant for us. Um, so it's, it's designed around the operation. Um, the operation is never going to be compromised because of the design. But in saying that, it has to, it has to be special. And I think in our business, we're, we're in the entertainment business. People want to be entertained. They want to sit at a counter and someone said to me, never open a restaurant that is everything to everyone. I completely disagree with that. We are everything to everyone. If you want to come in, sit at a counter or be in a private room, be out on the terrace, be in the bar, you have to. Today, businesses have to be agile and flexible and not have any reason why someone can say, I can't go there because of that. Um, it, it just limits your um, opportunity to fill seats and obviously restaurant seats only get filled. You can't fill them yesterday. Uh, they're gone. It's like airplanes. Um, so we have to, we have to have an offering. And for me, um, I actually pinch myself often thinking how the hell did I get away with this? How did I, first of all, be asked, get chosen, get to actually do it. Um, this is a restaurant totally dreamt up and um, you actually get to, you know, push it across the line and now we have to operate it um, and you have to operate it for a long time. So it has to work and you have to be happy with it and um, I pushed our architects every inch of the way and, you know, the, the ceiling for people who haven't seen the restaurant, we, we made a ceiling out of charcoal and Rod had done something else and, I said to Rod, look, it's just not working for me. And I said, I've, I've seen this image of the Giant's Causeway in Ireland where these basalt extrusions come out of the ground and it's all this um, sort of articulated. And I said, why don't we do that on the roof and make it out of charcoal and we could hide the sound attenuation and the speakers and the lights. And Rod's looking at me just – and I'm like, here, Rod, look, I'll show you. I'll sketch it. <laughs> you know, I'll start, I'll start drawing it and, and – um, you know, let's do the steel and, you know, I love Richard Serra, the sculptor, and I'd walk through one of Serra's installations in, in um, New York and the idea that you just are trans transported and I, I knew that the Crown Lobby was going to be really special and very different to what we're doing and I wanted people to walk into Woodcut and, and have it unfold, see so many different things. And people, I catch people, they're sitting there and I said, are you okay? You know, and they said, there's just so much to see. And uh, the detail and the attention to detail, and that's Sonny and I. We are we are um, ridiculously caught up in detail, uh, probably to our detriment in some respects. But um, I don't know how to do it another way, and I do it the way I do it. And um, I think the uh, woodcut, like I said before, this this has been. It's a journey that I never knew that we were really on until we were on it. Um, and I think from a career perspective, I've, 
I've never said no. I've never, um, I'm actually an incredible procrastinator. And I was saying the other day, there's so many things that I procrastinated about and never got back to someone who offered me a site that we could have opened a restaurant in that was fully funded. And I never called back at that investor that called me and cause I just didn't get there or, and I think the procrastination sometimes if I'd done those things, I wouldn't have done this. So mm-hmm. I don't, I don't know. Um, I can't say I'm, I'm this genius of planning or, you know, gut feel or whatever. I don't know how it happens. It just happens. And, you know, will I have another career after this? I don't know. Maybe, um, who knows? It's woodcut is now my focus. It's been in my mind for a long time, 15 odd years, maybe more, but it's, um, it's a restaurant of many, many moving pieces and every day it's much more exciting for that. So it's not a, I can't see the, I can't see the end of it. You know, sometimes I can see what it's going to be like in 10 years. I can't see what the end of woodcut's going to be. And that's very exciting for me. You mentioned the grand size of the restaurant and the four uh, kitchens. Give, give us a sense of um, what it's like to experience the restaurant. I, I think you come in and, and there's it's vast, but it's punctuated by the kitchens. And so you don't feel like you're in a dining hall. It's a 1,000 square metres. So for those people who understand what that means, uh, it's 300 seats. It's big. It's 100 metres. You walk from one end to the other. Um Wow. Senior staff are connected by headsets. I think we have 20 odd headsets in the restaurant at any given service from the managers to the sommeliers to the, obviously the chefs, the four kitchens are all connected um, because you have to communicate and I can't have four kitchens um, separated. They are separated, but they're not in my mind. They're all one kitchen. They're one team delivering a service so if one kitchen is incredibly busy one kitchen's watching them being busy i can't take four people from that kitchen and move them over to the other one um so my my role uh is to balance the menu to make sure that there's enough interesting offerings from every kitchen um that they can all operate at the same pace um, and th- there's a bit involved in that, um, but again, that's it's also uh, where do we put the duck? Are we going to grill that? Are we going to put that in one of the Romatovs, or are we going to put that in the wood oven? Well, look, that guy in the wood oven, he's only got two dishes. Let's put another dish over there. Okay, so how are we going to process that? I don't know, boys. You need to work that out, but the duck is going to go in the wood oven. So then Daniel and Twan, my head chefs, they go away and they – you know, so this restaurant for me is is I don't worry about the wall that needs to be painted. I don't worry if the air conditioner is broken. I don't worry about the stain on a chair. I don't worry about the reservations. I I go in and I focus on the things that I'm really passionate about and the things that interest me, and that's the luxury of Woodcut. Um, I can look at every kitchen and think, okay – new seasons and there's ingredients coming where's that best going to be suited and how's that going to what operating equipment are we going to use for that and what's the best way of delivering that you know we just put a spaghetti squash thing on the menu the other day and i love spaghetti squash but i've never been able to really serve it in the way that i wanted to and now i can say great let's do it in the wood oven let's brush it with um you know fermented butter put um, parmesan with it, all that stuff. We can just say to the guys, okay, <clears throat> this is what I want. Go away. I'll come back tomorrow and we'll play with it four different ways. And it's great. You mentioned how hard you worked and how tired you were at the bridge room with such a small site. How are you feeling uh, personally now running Woodcut compared to then? Um, I had a year off. Um, between, well, a sort of a, f- a forced year off. Um, we closed the bridge room. Uh, I still have a hotel consultancy business, so I had no income after we closed the bridge room. So like I said, my COVID started a bit before COVID. Um, so I had to race to find work. I Most of my work was in Melbourne. I used to go to Melbourne for three days a week. It's hard when you've got a young child as well. We have a, a five-year-old daughter. 
Um, and I was in Melbourne three days a week. I'm working on a hotel uh, in Melbourne, a 350 room hotel for a New York based company. I was helping uh, Fender Castellides, who uh, were the architects for Mona. David Walsh is doing a hotel in Tasmania. Um, so I was doing some facilitating some of the planning with the architects in Melbourne. Um, we're doing five projects on the Great Ocean Road for another architecture firm. Um, I helped Adrian Finney do the Como in Perth. So I've, I've always had things on that I could sort of uh, find an income. Um, and to be honest, if Crown hadn't happened, we probably would have gone back overseas again. Um, that was probably the intention. And um, then COVID hit. And um, so COVID sort of was a my work dried up in Melbourne. There was some that kept going because it was architects who were working, investors who were still, they were still in their planning processes. So I could work from home and, and do all that sort of stuff. And I was also working on woodcut. Um, but it also gave me time, you know, with Bronte. She was reading, she was learning to read, to write. Um, I took the training wheels off her bicycle. I remember her, you know, getting on a boogie board in the ocean and all the stuff that probably if I'd been at the bridge room, you would have missed out on. Um, and it gave me, I lost 15 kilos. I started training, went to the gym, stopped drinking, stopped eating, stopped living, you know, ridiculous restaurant hours. Um, I knew I had to be mentally and physically fit for the woodcut, for woodcut. Um, COVID in many respects helped with our staff because a lot of chefs that were overseas mm -hmm. had to come back to Australia because the restaurants in London, Singapore, Hong Kong, they were all closing and they were expatriates and their visas weren't being reissued as happened in Australia um, for people who were foreign that had to go home from Australia. So we had um, an incredible amount of applications for woodcut. Um, I mean, off the charts, we interviewed 500 people. Um, so in many respects, it was hard because a lot of people were looking to us for security for, for employment. And I was listening to your podcasts and really, um, listening to how hard people were going through their COVID experiences. And I felt really bad because for us, it was actually helping us recruit people. Um, so that, that is something that is, has also been really challenging is as much as, you know, we're, we're trying to launch something in a time that is incredibly difficult. Um, and there were delays and, you know, there were a lot of things that were not coming into the country. We did have no idea of how we were going to launch a restaurant with the seating requirements and, and, um, masks and so forth and everything changed. And, you know, it's, the world has changed and uh, we, we're all dealing with what the new, what it's it's all going to look like. No one can really tell, I don't think. And the fact that we're doing currently 400 people a day, uh, it, it's an incredibly busy restaurant, um, tells me that too. And we, we're not the only one that's busy, the whole precinct's busy. But that just means that people are just dying to get out, see things, see new things. And um, we are a city of people that always seem to want something new and um so yeah it's opening woodcut has i suppose given me the the um the opportunity to to do something in a very very tough environment incredibly tough environment and i'm very humbled and thankful for that well, Ross, it's extraordinary to take the deep dive in your, into your life and, um, and the key moments and, and what you're doing now at Woodcut. Um, absolutely extraordinary. Um, we've loved having you on Deep in the Weeds, uh, today. Um, Please keep in touch. Sorry, it's taken me a year, Hanks. I know, I know. You asked me a year ago. Well, you have, well, it's good to hear that you've been busy. I have been hassling you for a little while to come on the show, but um, it's been bloody worthwhile, mate. It's extraordinary uh, to hear your story, and um, no doubt there's much more to it as well. So I think I'd love to catch up again sometime down the track as well and um, see, see yeah, how you're going. Um, maybe, maybe, maybe in a year. Um, 
we might have another woodcut. So let's see. Let's see what happens. Brilliant. Uh, Ross, mate, keep in touch and uh, we'll talk again soon. Always a pleasure, buddy. Talk to you soon. This is the Deep in the Weeds podcast. I'm Anthony Huckstep. Stay tuned as we share the stories of Australia's HOSPO community, suppliers and producers in search of hope during this pandemic. Special thanks to executive producer Rob Locke for making this all happen. Follow us on Instagram at Deep in the Weeds Podcast or email us at podcast at deepintheweeds.com.au. Stay safe and be well. <laughs>